Well, hello, that's me again. Today is May 3. It is Friday. Thank God it's Friday. And I will start with uh, what uh, the very grim anniversary of what had happened uh, 10 years ago on May uh, uh, 2, 2014. And uh, obviously, uh, the Western media never reported on that. It's just, uh, as we already know, I do not have to repeat constantly that there are very few normal people working in Western media. But uh, Odessa massacre perpetrators must be punished Kremlin. They are talking about that, the, well, they talk about the key failure to properly prosecute those responsible for the post coup atrocity in 2014 is shameful. Dmitry Peskov stated. He's talking about the situation in Odessa on May 2nd, 2014, when hundreds actually of people have been uh, run into the what is called the Trade Union's house, which is a palace essentially, and they've been burned alive there, and many of them have been executed. I mean, yes, execution style, you know, with the control shots to the head, and uh, they have been burned alive. So, uh, yeah, because obviously we know that uh, the Western, uh, not perception, that's not perception, they knew everything. It was organized by the uh, uh, Nazis uh, uh, and Nazis from uh, Western Ukraine, but many people in Odessa also participated in that. Scores of protesters were killed in the heart of the port city on May 2nd, 2000. 14, after they were chased by a mob into a governmental building, the local House of Trade Unions, which was then set on fire and barricaded. They say it's at least 40 people. The reality is they officially announced 49, but the uh, actual number is much higher. Some people say we're talking about way above 100 people. So it was normal the day in Ukraine where you execute civilians. And... Um, the <laughs> Ukrainian officials have claimed that the deaths of in Odessa were the result of provocation by would-be separatists. Well, you know this tune, don't you? You know about this so-called massacre in Bucha, which was organized, obviously, by SBU and its curators from MI6 and CIA. So, and that continues, you know, and to Russians unearth periodically their graves, where the people are actually there. Yes, it actually is the case in Gaza. It, it's, the pattern is the same. They have, you know, executed with their hands tied behind their backs. So, yeah, that was a horrible, horrible uh, uh, anniversary yesterday. So, and people have to keep this in mind because it actually fits extremely well into as the piece of the puzzle. What is going on? Not that the West uh, uh, in general really cares uh, and uh, that especially um, of um, um, Western media really care about it, as already state, uh, stated, most of them are stabbed with the sociopaths. So, but you have to keep this in mind, and that was the bad, uh, I mean, very sad anniversary. Now we get to the uh, issue of... Um, how to put it politely? Uh, I don't even know... Um, how to this how to comment on that and it's you know what uh two days ago bloomberg talk, uh, talks about that russians who fled abroad returning boost for putin's war economy as many as a million russians fled left uh, fled abroad in the first year of the kremlin's invasion of ukraine now thousands are returning home delivering a propaganda victory to president vladimir putin and a boost to uh, uh, this war economy it's Bloomberg, as I already stated, which actually fits well extremely with the, this grim anniversary of uh, which haven't been properly reported in the West. In Odessa, 10 years ago, normal people do not work in uh, most uh, Western uh, media. Well, many uh, are pretty much the same, for example, in Russian media, but the amount of uh, quantity, so to speak, or quality of the sociopathy of uh, Western journalism is just just absolutely through the roof. So they are inventing things. And guess what? The Russians, of course, you know, uh, look at this and just, you know. And so what are they discussing? Who were those relicants? The businesses didn't work out, they report Bloomberg. No one is really waiting for us abroad, said Alexei, a 50-year-old former political consultant from Moscow.
Now, Bloomberg now, come up with this, I mean, absolutely preposterous thing, which, of course, they pulled it out of their asses because normal people, as already stated, they are, they are, they are pretty much all prostitutes there. But the point is that uh, they now come up with a number that up to quarter to third of Russian economy have been boosted by these uh, people. Okay, okay, Russians, of course, you know, homerically laugh at that. But uh, to uh, give you the port of relocants, so to speak, as they called, or basically the guys who were just running away. Um, well, let me put it this way. <laughs> Here is the uh, actually uh, reaction by the uh, very famous Russian uh, resource. It's Ukraine.ru. It is a uh, uh, Russian resource. And they talk about the fate of relocators, what they fled from and why they are coming back. And so they discuss it, and uh, here it is. Look what they uh, point out. It is customary for us to talk breathlessly about IT specialists. Well, the people, those people uh, will find work anywhere. And it is true, not all of them, but many of them. In 2022, according to Russian Association of Electronic Communications, 50 to 70,000 computer specialists left Russia. And why did, uh, did you come back now? They ask those who returned. The main reason is household and visa inconveniences. There is no good internet, no delivery of food and goods, expensive housing, expensive life, lack of the usual social circle. There are no exhibitions, no theaters, and no travel three times a year. And for some, such as an option in the ambulance uh, and the possibility of hospitalization have disappeared. Almost all relocators are residents of big cities. They are accustomed to a certain level and way of life, very high, and they thought that they would live even better in the conditional West, if it turned out that this, uh, it turned out that this wasn't the case. So basically, you have those pampered uh, infantiles who left Russia. Most of them are cowards anyway. So, but look at this: Ross Business Consulting, a very, very respectable business. Uh, um, uh, publication gives uh, a few days ago there um, some of the portraits, so to speak. And look at this. This is in regards to Uzbekistan, where they ran into Uzbekistan, some of them. Others ran to Kazakhstan, others to Georgia, and then, you know, very few of them really got into the uh, old west. But, but, here what they say. Here's the portrait of a relocator. After studying the resumes of 750 relocators from Russia, the Uzbek Institute of Forecasting and Macroeconomic Research named the main feature of Russian immigrant. Its average age is 32 years. More than 93% of newcomers have a higher degree education. And the average work experience is eight years. Engineers constitute 18% uh, of them. We have to uh, uh, really uh, be very careful when we talk about engineers. Years. And IT specialists, 15%, as well as managers, marketers, management specialists, and administrative staff mainly come to the country. So basically, most of those people who run away uh, with the start of special military operation, and now most of them are returning. Well, they're not returning because they are such a, you know, patriots or something like that, because they're just pampered, you know, uh, uh, jerks, and they cannot live, as already they have been stated, without all those conveniences with this backward Russia offers them, especially if you live in a large city such as Moscow, Kazan, St. Petersburg, Yekaterinburg, Vladivostok, you suddenly, oh, yeah, life in the West is not that sweet. It, right and of course we have those IT people this is uh, all together the whole other story about them and the portrait of them is yeah most of them are people who have useless or uh, lack thereof I mean skills and like managers who needs managers who needs marketologists you, you don't need those people. These are useless professions which are absolutely irrelevant in the modern world, except, of course, for the basically financial driven economy, such as, you know, and uh, as you saw yourself, there is a guy who was political consultant. Wow, my goodness. So, and as if to contradict this uh, BS from, um, obviously, 
Bloomberg and other idiots who uh, continue to spread this BS, not having understanding what Russia is and what it does, we have this uh, uh, situation with, um, how to put it politely, here is... Uh, something which has nothing to do with those relocators and most of those relocators will not find a decent job anymore because those uh, positions they were redundant or useless anyway so they will be probably uh, living much much different life when they returned but here it is we have today's uh, uh, information from the raw stack and uh, here is Sergei Chemizov told Russian Prime Minister Mikhail Mishustin during a meeting on Friday that around 80% of arms used by the Russian military in the conflict are being supplied by Rostec. I already uh, uh, did, I believe, their uh, review of Rostec. It is a gigantic company, colossal really. And so it's not surprising that uh, most of Russian arms are produced within it. And here what is Mr. Chemizov uh, tells Mr. Uh, uh, Mikhail Mishustin. Compared to 2022, the production and refurbishment of tanks at our factories increased by three and a half times, and of lightly armed light armored vehicles by three times, the Rostec chief state. Uh, and here he gives you some numbers. The output of ammunition rounds for tanks and infantry fighting vehicles increased by 900%, artillery shells by 600%, and munitions for MLRS by 800%. Three times as many unguided rockets for heavy flamethrower systems are being produced, Chemizov said. The, uh, Obviously, surge cap uh, capacity of uh, Russian economy is just absolutely immense. And that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about all those, uh, most of them, 99.9% uh, of so-called economists in the West, they have no idea what economy is. And uh, as uh, incomparable Michael Hudson says that, yeah, the, basically what is being taught is economy in uh, Western universities and to a degree in Russian universities. It's all garbage, basically. It's all uh, whiteboard theories and hence uh, this uh, uh, you know um cognitive dissonance among all those pandas who themselves are very illiterate people to put it mildly that they do not understand how with the gdp of smaller than italy russia is out producing combined west well because you don't know economy most of them are as already stated you know they're just you know whiteboard theorists of some bs which is not even science nor it is a real economy and they cannot comprehend how you can produce so much and russia is continuing to actually increase her military production because it is not about obviously just Ukraine. It is about NATO and you know we you can sense the a lot of butt hurt and you know what uh, insults for people who saw how uh, Russia parades uh, all those equipment NATO equipment allegedly incredibly powerful equipment. So, and then, how to put it politely, here we have this guy, he, this clown, I don't know, friends, you, uh, you've elected him, live with it. It's your problem, it's your humiliation, and you needed it anyway, so at least maybe give you a chance to <clears throat> get, you know, some proper leaders. But um, Francis Macron doesn't rule out troops for Ukraine, again. French President Emmanuel Macron said he has not ruled out sending ground troops to Ukraine if Russia breaks through Ukrainian front lines and the government in Kyiv made such a request. So, yeah, sure, uh, again, uh, France cannot send more than a uh, few thousands, probably, I don't know, two, three thousand <coughs> incomplete brigade to uh, Ukraine. They will be all annihilated. Ask uh, Scott Ritter. Even the fully, uh, uh, fully developed, so to speak, fully uh, uh, staffed and uh, uh, armed, the uh, you would say heavy brigade of uh, Bundeswehr, let's say, or any kind of NATO country, which is about five, six thousand people with hundreds of the vehicles, all kinds of you know attached units and things like that, three to seven days. That's about it. After that, if you look attentively at the fate of the 40 summons, which is the best NATO-equipped brigade of armed forces of Ukraine, it lasted 
I mean, not very long because it has been reconstituted. That means what it been it has been fully destroyed. The new uh, uh, basically badge of the cannon fodder is stuffed into this brigade, into this placeholder, so to speak. It's been uh, it has been annihilated yet again, and then the next uh, uh, basically bunch of the <coughs> cannon fodder comes in. So that's how uh, Ukraine and NATO generals who really run this operation. Uh, as uh, Mr. Skibitsky, for example, uh, and he is the second uh, intelligence, so-called, you know, guy, deputy head of Ukraine's military intelligence, uh, talks about yesterday that, um, yeah, the prospects for Rus uh, armed forces of Ukraine are really bad. He sounds troubled as he assesses Ukraine's battlefield prospects. Things, he says, are as difficult as they have ever been since the early days of Russia's full-scale invasion. And they are about to get worse. Uh, keep in mind, this is The Economist. This is the uh, magazine from United Kingdom, which actually never publishes uh, the names of uh, those people who write this BS. But even this, I mean, propaganda outlet it, it has to basically admit and, you know, armed forces of Ukraine admit that it's pretty much over. So if you take a look, for example, on the map, <clears throat> This is yesterday. Uh, you see uh, why, for example, this is a good map. And this is done by professionals, uh, not only because of the colors, obviously. As you can see yourself in the right uh, uh, lower corner, you have the scale. You see, four kilometers, five kilometers. They give you uh, distances uh, <coughs> and ranges you can really uh, comprehend when looking at the <coughs> map. And as you can see yourself and... Um, with the fall of Acheretina and uh, Nova Kalino, we have another, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, cauldron, so to speak, surrounding, forming. Uh, people say there are up to 30,000 of, uh, you know, Ukrainian cannon for the stuff there. So, yeah, probably. But if you look at the upper right corner, and I know it sounds uh, crazy, but... New York is about to fall. Yes, Ukraine has the town, as you can see yourself, underlined with the red. It's called New York. So there you go. Well, if you think so, that these people have their own real serious history. Uh, for Just to give you an example, Lvov, the city of Lvov, Western Ukraine, has the actually, you know, a Statue of Liberty. No, I'm not kidding you. It's Statue of Liberty, but it sits there. So that tells you pretty much that these people are, how to put it politely, I'm not going to go into the uh, idiosyncrasies of the Ukrainian national character, but yeah, it tells you quite a bit. And so, yeah, New York also probably going to fall <laughs> fairly soon. But you, as you can see yourself, situation is pretty critical there. And if you go and look at the losses, so here we have losses for April, uh, and in April uh, 2024, we have 29,420 militants of the armed forces of Ukraine were destroyed. The maximum losses were recorded in the Donetsk direction, where the most intensive attacks uh, of the Russian armed forces took place. 13,445 uh, militants, equally heavy losses at Avdiivka, obviously, which is uh, allocated at a separate front in the middle of Donetsk, uh, 9,540 uh, militants. And if you take a look attentively at the uh, uh, losses in terms of um, hardware, in terms of armor, for example, so we have that uh, 238 tanks and other armored vehicles were destroyed. 364 have been destroyed in March. Uh, all captured equipment, including the standard of American military thought, the Abrams tank, is now on display in the open air museum in Moscow. 963 vehicles have been destroyed and the number of destroyed artillery increased significantly. 622 in a month uh, compared to 371 in March. So the demolition continues and again, Russians are not rushing. There is no ne necessity to throw somebody into breakthrough. 
it's it's gonna happen one way or another and it's happening the front is collapsing and the uh, um, news which coming from the um, front line and through my friends and through official even channels that doesn't look good they are pretty much pinned down there and being I mean obliterated to smithereens I mean blown up to smithereens so and you know that's what happens and uh, if that hasn't been enough, we have now the situation with the, um, how to put it politely, somebody, you know, rings the bells of alarm, you know, and it wasn't uh, uh, in April, but it's been uh, circulated now constantly. It is about the fact that Russia funneling weapons through Libyan port, Iron Gateway to Africa. It is a uh, Rome, Russian vessels have been unloading thousands of tons of military equipment in the eastern Libyan port of Tobruk this month after repeated visits by Russia's de uh, deputy defense minister Yunus Bek Yevkurov to General Khalifa Haftar, the strongman running eastern Libya. Here is Mr. Yevkurov <coughs> with Mr. Haftar. And um, uh, Yunus Bek Yevkurov is a really legendary man in uh, Russian army and here they are, you know, shaking hands and obviously Yunus Bek Yevkurov was in Libya for a very serious reason. And so now they are, you know, again, they just raising alarm that the shipments arriving from the Russian controlled port of Tartus in Syria contain towed uh, artillery, armor personnel, carriers and rocket launchers according to the video released by Libyan news site. So the equipment may in part be used to sustain Russia's growing military presence in eastern Libya, but also, which is correct, yeah, most likely being uh, redistributed to, uh, to Africa and, you know, basically mopping up all those remnants of the Western, you know, colonial powers. Some experts see the uptick in activity as a result of America's diplomatic strategy towards Haftar, which has failed. Well, what's the news? Everything America does nowadays fails and which has failed to stop the warlord from allying with Russia and given Moscow the chance to pour weapons into the country, turning it into the gateway to supply its growing presence across Africa. The criticism goes. Eastern Libya is becoming a significant uh, way station into Africa for Russia and it comes after the US seriously misplayed Haftar. Again, what's the news? Tell me when in the last 10 years the United States didn't misplay anything said Ben Fishman, a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. And this is uh, this all continues with the fact that, you know, Fishman argued that the US should have enlisted the help of the UAE or Egypt, who back for Haftar. Egypt has no interest in an increased Russian presence across the border in Libya. This was a missed opportunity, he said. I don't know what uh, Egypt has in mind. It is a bankrupt country, very poor. And in this particular case, uh, we know that Haftar has a very good relations with uh, <coughs> Egypt. I mean, he has a lot of connections there. So it's kind of, you know what, at this stage, nobody cares what Egypt thinks. Nothing wrong with Egypt per se, you know, with all deepest respect to this group great nation. But the point is, it's a big guy's game, you know. And so here, um, Fishman says that before marshalling troops in Libya, Haftar was a CIA asset, living for years in Virginia. Sure, why not? Fishman said to reduce Russia's ability to use Tobruk, there could be disruption of radar use or the stationing of uh, vessels off the coast. But that is now impossible now given our commitment in the Red Sea. No, it is not about the commitment in the Red Sea. It is impossible because obviously nobody wants to clash with Russia directly and they will not do it. And uh, uh, although, hey, uh, it has to be stated very clearly, for example, uh, Denmark uh, wants to, well, floats this idea of closing Danish Straits for Russians. Well, good luck doing this. Uh, Maria Zaharova already reacted on that issue, and uh, what can I say? Uh, it is, uh, it goes across, uh, you know, and in violation of the all possible rules and conventions uh, signed about the, uh, the, uh, the Danish Straits. I've been there. I remember how Dutch Royal Dutch Navy behaved itself like jerks with two of their minesweepers trying to actually interdict the movement of our ship, Pericop. So, but, you know what, what can I say? Good old story. But, 
And uh, as if, you know, about Libya, Libya is obviously very uh, important, and here you, you see yourself that this is yours truly in the Saprata. It's a beautiful Phoenician city, actually, the wonderful museum, and used to be. Not anymore, I don't think so, it's there anymore. Tripoli, of course, is a funny city, it was a combination of the... All kinds of things, you know, ranging from Arab culture and all that, and then there are a lot of, uh, uh, you know, European influences, all those modern hotels and things like that. But yeah, very sandy though, very sandy. So I've been there, and Libya always was important for Russia, and it remains so. Now, in conclusion, we have now this situation developing. This is all about Africa. Suddenly Reuters, exclusive Russian troops enter base housing U.S. military in Niger. You know, Niger, if you wish, U.S. official says. Uh, Russian military personnel have entered an air base in Niger that is hosting U.S. troops. A senior U.S. defense official told Reuters, a move that follows a decision by Niger's junta to expel U.S. forces from the country. So, and um, as you can see yourself, they say that... Um, a senior defense uh, official speaking on conditions of anonymity, they're, they're always, an, always anonymous. That is why nobody wants to, you know, bear any responsibility for what they say or what they incite. However, it's, this uh, says that Russian forces were not mingling with U.S. troops, but were using a separate hangar at Air Base 101, which is next to Diori Hamani International Airport in Niamey, Niger's uh, uh, capital. The move by Russian military puts U.S. and Russian troops in close proximity at the time when the nation's military and diplomatic rivalry is increasingly acrimonious over the conflict in Ukraine. Well, it's not only acrimonious, Russians already stated very clearly that uh, if things continue as they continue, at some point of time they will downgrade the diplomatic relations with the United States to a level of the consulate not all ambassadors and at some point of time if they will continue to do what they are doing then you know what the issue of the breaking of their uh, diplomatic relations also is now out of the consideration this has been stated by mr ripkov first deputy uh, uh, foreign minister and then actually mr lavrov said too so did uh, miss mrs uh, maria zaharova so this is uh, how to put it politely. When you look attentively at what is happening, and especially with the, uh, you know, uh, American Constitution being stomped at by the U.S. Congress, which is controlled by uh, Israel, and United States being nothing more than the uh, Israel, you know, bully and having no uh, uh, independent foreign policy, and of course having nothing to do with the interest of the American people, majority of them, with the exception of those fanatics from evangelical uh, cults, which think that, you know, that this end of times and rapture garbage, you know, so that Israel is, you know, the, the, the matter of, uh, most important matter in the uh, faith, but you know what? So yeah, United States entered the post-constitutional uh, state and is on its way towards the totalitarian uh, state, sadly. So, and the violation of the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment is happening in the front of our eyes. I'm not going to go into those uh, pro-Palestinian demonstrations by the students because I don't know the whole story. And I usually do not uh, really uh, comment on things I don't know and I don't want to speculate. Obviously, it is very important politically and obviously it uh, affects the uh, election uh, cycle, so to speak. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is that U.S. Congress now going to shut down American mouth. And all those myth this mythology about the freedom of speech is thrown out of the window because United States is a, well, I'm sorry, slap bitch of Israel. So there you go. That's what I needed to tell you today. And uh, in conclusion, guys, as always, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel. And those who can afford, please support me through Patreon or buy me a coffee and two. And uh, I'll talk to you later and have a nice weekend in front of yourself. Thank God it's Friday. Bye-bye.